The Kanchenjunga mountain range is a breathtaking marvel of nature nestled in the eastern Himalayas. In this video, we embark on a journey of discovery, exploring the fascinating beauty and captivating allure of one of the world's most enchanting places. Spanning across the border between Nepal in the east and the Indian state of Sikkim in the west, Kanchanjunga stands tall as the third highest mountain in the world at an elevation of an awe-aspiring 8,586 meters. The Kanchanjunga was presumed to be the tallest mountain of the world until 1852. Later excursions proved that the tallest mountain of the world is Mount Everest or as it's often called Sagarmatha and the Kanchanjunga is only the third tallest mountain of the world. Kanchanjunga still holds a cultural significance for the people of Darjeeling as well as the people living around Kanchanjunga. There exists a profound bond between the people and the mountain range. It's not just another geographical wonder. It represents the indomitable spirit and resilience of the communities surrounding the Kanchanjunga mountain. The Kanchanjunga mountain and the entire range of Kanchanjunga is a symbol of strength. The image of this mountain range is often seen on a 100 rupee currency note issued by India. This not only shows the importance of this mountain to the people of Nepal, but also the people of the entire country of India. It's after all the tallest mountain of India. I was a person who was raised in Darjeeling and from my childhood days I looked up into the Kanchanjunga range and wondered what kind of world lies out there? What lies on and beyond those snow-capped peaks? Every time I wanted to go there and see it for myself what lies beyond the lands which everyone says is unreachable. This time I made my travel to Darjeeling to go to the foothills of the Kanchenjunga mountains. This is my story and the story of my journey to the Kanchenjunga base camp. I would like to welcome you all to this journey as we pass through the beautiful and serene Kanchenjunga conservation area and then head to the high mountains of the Yalong glacier. We see spectacular views and try to look for amazing plants and animals while looking at breathtaking sceneries. There are four climbing routes to reach the summit of Kanchanjunga, three of which are in Nepal and the fourth one is Sikkim. Accompanied with each climbing route is a trek to its base camp. Until today, the route from Sikkim has only been successfully used three times. It's not that it's a difficult route. It's just that the Indian government doesn't allow expeditions to the Kanchanjunga. Therefore, the route has been closed since the past 23 years. Because of the remote location and the difficulty of accessibility to this trek, the region has not been explored by trekkers. That's the reason it holds the pristine beauty within itself. But with pristine beauty, it also holds extreme dangers. Despite improved climbing gear, the fatality rate of climbers attempting to summit the Kanchanjunga mountain is over 20%. I started my journey in Darjeeling and I had to drive all the way to Mirik through beautiful tea gardens of Darjeeling to reach the border town of Pasupatinagar. From Pashupatinagar, I took another taxi to the other border town of Ilam, which is also the heart of tea plantation of Nepal. So it was a journey directly from the tea plantations of Darjeeling to the tea plantations of Nepal. Listening to local songs made this arduous and long journey more pleasant and entertaining. <laughs> Thank you. 
it felt short, but in the end, it took me over 12 hours to reach the town of Taplejung. After almost 12 hours on different kinds of roads, winding through the mountains and valleys, I reached Taplejung. Taplejung is the headquarters of the Kanchenjunga region. I initially imagined Taplejung to be a very tiny town, but the town seemed full of hustle and bustle. Later, I realized that the hustle and bustle was not just from tourists who were trying to go to the Kanchenjunga base camp, but from the tourists who were on a religious pilgrimage. Most people come to this place to a very well-known shrine known as Patibhara Temple. There are hardly a few people who actually go up the Kanchenjunga base camp trail. It is not only advisable, but it's also very smart to do this trail with more people with you. This trail is not particularly good for solo hikers or free independent trekkers. This trail is dangerous and wild. This trail is full of excitement. Hence, the Nepal government does not allow permits very easily into this region. You need to have a guide with you and also it's better if you're traveling in a group. I couldn't manage to get a group, but I surely had a friend who was happy to guide me along this trail along with one more of his client who was from Malaysia. There are four trekking routes to reach Kanchenjunga. We were planning to visit the north and the south base cab. Starting from Taplejung, we would take a taxi on the dirt road all the way up to Sekatum. From Sekatum, we would start walking uphill along the valley where the Gunsa and the Tamu river flows. We had two options in front of us, either visit the south base camp first and then go north or visit the north base camp first. There was a way from Sekatum, which goes to the south base camp first through Torongten or we could go up to the north base camp and cross the Selele Pass and reach Ramche and Cheram. We decided to go to the north base camp first. Crossing the village of Amjilosa, Gyabla and Fale we would reach Gunsa. At Gunsa, we would rest after three days of strenuous trekking. After a rest day at Gunsa, we would go further uphill to Khambachen and Lonak and finally reach the North Base Camp. From the North Base Camp, we would come back to the Kumbhakarna Base Camp and then head down to Gunsa. From Gunsa, we would cross the Selele Pass to reach the village of Sherem. From Sherem, we can go uphill to the South Base Camp. I was greeted by a little friend who wanted me to piggybag him on my backpack. I sadly had to tell him that it's too dangerous for a little fellow like him to go up the mountains. We started our journey with seven people on the dirt road. As the taxi slowly moved down the winding roads across very sharp turns and curves, we were presented with some very picturesque scenery of the mountain that lay ahead. Slowly and steadily, the load on the vehicle started increasing as more people started getting into the vehicle. The conditions of the road and the load on the vehicle made me worried. The vehicle was clearly overloaded, but I was assured that the skill of the local drivers are far better than drivers on the cities because they drive through these bumpy roads every day. 
we were heading into the land of flowers, plants and beautiful scenery. People were often amazed at seeing my GoPro camera, which I often stuck out of the car to see how loaded the car was. They had a fun time. We finally made it in the evening. After a long drive, we decided not to stay at Sekatu but go to the next tiny hamlet, which was called Eatery. We spent the night alongside the river Gunsa, eating thukpa for dinner and having a good night's sleep after a very long day of travel because the days ahead of us had difficult terrain. People who have lived for centuries in these high mountains treasure the gift of nature that is bestowed upon them. They often say that the mountains are their protectors and the rivers nurture their spirits. The interdependence between human beings and the natural world can be seen here in its raw, natural form. It's difficult to get here, but to see such harmony between nature and mankind, we need to get to such a secluded place nestled in the high Himalayas. This land not only shelters spiritual souls but also hosts incredible biodiversities. It's easy to spot creatures like the red panda or a leopard out here. Himalayan super food. <laughs> Himalayan berry, right? Himalayan berry. <laughs> White berry. Namaste. Namaste. How do you think it is? In the embrace of these ancient mountains and flowing rivers, many find inspiration to cherish, protect and heal their troubled souls. I was one of them too, looking for inspiration. Nestled in the heart of this conservation area is the Gunsa River, which weaves its way through the lush valleys and towering mountains. It casts a spell of enchantment upon everyone who listens to its flow. It's gentle yet persistent and it's like a song which is more than just a natural phenomenon. It's the lifeline for the diverse ecosystem that it nourishes. As I stood on its bank, I was captivated by the symphony of the Gunsa River. The sound of the flowing river is a melody that resonates with the soul. 
It begins as a faint murmur in the distance and as it trickles down from its higher reaches, the murmur evolves into a melodious hum. As the water gathers momentum, carving its way through the rugged terrain, the murmur turns into a roar and it feels like the Gunsa River was narrating a story of the mountains which it has traversed. The locals out here often say that if you listen to the sounds of the river closely, you might hear some voices. The voices of your ancestors who are trying to speak to you. They believe that the water holds the soul of the people who have passed. For generations, the indigenous communities that inhabit this region have revered this river as a deity, a manifestation of divine itself. Its flowing waters are believed to carry blessings of gods. Standing by the river bank, I almost felt the presence of this ancient wisdom. It was like I was having a sacred dialogue with nature. As I walked alongside the Gunsa River, I felt a deep sense of reverence for the profound connection between nature and spirituality. The river's melody spoke to me. It wove intangible threads through my existence and whispered a delicate balance that it sustains. Gunsa is not just yet another river down the valley. It's an interplay of nature, spirituality and life. Its sounds carry the wisdom of generations and hopes for the future generations. Let us also remember the importance in being custodians of our sacred lands and our nature. And I just hope that the Gunsa River keeps playing its harmony for the millennia to come for our future generations. Among this haven of biodiversity, Buddhist monasteries stand as a beacon of spiritual solace. They hold the ancient wisdom that binds all life together, preaching compassion and reverence for every living being. Time seems to be suspended here, and the rhythm of life flows in harmony of the elements of nature here. The sound of chanting echoes through the valley. It's a gentle reminder of the impermanence of existence, life being just an eternal cycle of birth, death and rebirth. Trekking from Seka to Gyabla, Fale and then to Gunza offered us a diverse and captivating journey through the Himalayas. The terrain transitioned from lush green forests to rocky paths within an altitude ranging from 2000 to 3000 meters. It took us two days to reach Gunza. As we ascended, we witnessed breathtaking views of snow-capped peaks, meandering rivers and alpine meadows. The region was adorned with rhododendron forest and vibrant wildlife. Sadly, we couldn't see any wildlife, but domestic animals were everywhere.
Along the way, we came across quaint hamlets and interacted with warm and welcoming locals. We got an insight into their culture and their way of life. Nature imparted us valuable lessons through this trek. The ever-changing landscapes teach us resilience, adaptability and the importance of preserving the fragile ecosystem. It only increases your appreciation for the beauty of nature. The trek was not just only a physical journey for me. It was beyond that. It was a spiritual journey. After two days of rigorous trekking from Sekhatum, we finally arrived in Gunsa and we were greeted by a gentle patter of raindrops that seemed to celebrate our safe arrival. After a good night's sleep, the morning arrived with a golden promise. The sun rays broke through a lingering mist, unraveling the breathtaking panorama of the Himalayan peaks surrounding Gunsa. I had a hearty breakfast of Sampa porridge, which is a Himalayan superfood that infuses new energy. Gunsa is a serene Buddhist settlement and it felt like a tranquil sanctuary nestled in the heart of the Grand Himalayas. The village has a rich history and it served as an acclimatization point for people who are embarking the journey onto the high altitudes. Eager to explore, I wandered through the village's narrow lanes and traditional stone houses and adorned the colorful player flags of the Buddhist mantra and it felt like it had sprung directly from the landscape into the houses. The people of Gunsa were warm and welcoming and their hospitality mirroring the beauty of their surroundings. As I ventured deeper into the mountains surrounding the village, I was rewarded with the sight of a stunning vibrant bird perched on a rhododendron branch. Far away in the mountain, I also spotted a stupa made entirely of ice, like a diamond that was far in the reaches of the Himalayas. My curiosity led me into a school, which was a modest building but filled with eager children who called it their home. They lived there with the minimum necessities but displayed the indomitable spirit that has always inspired me. Their laughters and smiles just painted the school walls and that kind of gave a testament to the resilience of human spirit in the face of adversity. I crossed paths with a friendly pup named Gasho. He belonged to the owner of the Zongla family home. A bond was instant and we became companions. We walked through the villages and the surroundings. At midst the backdrop of the approaching summer, I witnessed goats give birth and it reminded me of the cycle of nature, of birth, death and rebirth. As the day unfolded, I discovered that my friend and guide was not only skilled in navigation through treacherous trails, but also he possessed a beautiful singing voice.
The evening was filled with songs and laughter and the scents that brought warmth to all our hearts. With our bodies and spirits rejuvenated by this day of rest and acclimatization at Gunsa, we eagerly prepared ourselves for the next leg of our trek to embrace the challenges that lie beyond the high Himalayas. Gunsa offered a glimpse into the world untouched by time. I am at a very high place on this planet. What's the altitude? Altitude, mm. this one, this one is 36. 3600 meters altitude and today I am going to prove the earth is flat. It's a flat disk, not a round ball. Next time we'll prove earth is the shape of samosa. Hey, look, I'm so horny. I have two horns, I'm horny. Our day began with a breathtaking sight, a crystal clear morning sky devoid of any clouds. The air was astonishingly cold though, but the first rays of sun brought comfort as it touched our skin. It was a perfect day to start a day filled with adventure as we set out on the trip from Gunsa to Khambache. Climbing from 3,200 meters to 4,200 meters, our journey kicked off at the crack of dawn, with the world still bathing in the soft, gentle hues of the sunrise. We anticipated this to be a four to six hour trek, but the rugged terrain and the unexpected landslides slowed our progress significantly. We had no choice but to move forward with caution. As we ventured forward, the magical Himalayan landscape began to reveal its wonders. The first delightful surprise came in the form of primula plants. These delicate wildflowers had burst into bloom, creating a mesmerizing landscape dotted with vivid yellow splashes. It was as though nature herself had taken up a paintbrush and created this stunning masterpiece against the backdrop of towering peaks. We continued our journey along the winding trails and we stumbled upon a mesmerizing spectacle that left us awestruck. Tan had just begun its ascent, casting its golden rays upon the night's lingering frost. The frost had blanketed the grassy terrain. The delicate frost crystals glistened and sparkled like a thousand diamonds in the morning. It was a sight to behold. As the sun's warmth kissed the frost, it embarked on a dance of transformation. The frost melted and evaporated at the same time. The mountains granted us with an ethereal experience, which felt like though the mountains were breathing fire in the morning. Sometimes we find ourselves in the right place at the right time, witnessing the magic of nature. Our paths also led us through the rhododendron forest. That was a feast for the eyes. The rhododendron flowers were a kaleidoscope of colors with various species of rhododendrons showing off their vibrant blooms. These radiant flowers are not just only beautiful, but also have various medicinal and herbal properties, which people often from faraway places come to study. These flowers are also an essential source of nectar for the bees that produce the infamous 
Nepal's mad honey. This unique honey is famous for its psychoactive properties, which causes mild hallucinations and sense of euphoria when consumed in moderation. People often from various parts of the world visit Nepal to get a taste of this mad honey. Landslides, they serve as a stark reminder of the power of nature and the fragility of human existence in such remote places where often help is days away. A simple mishap can lead to fatal injuries and just show you how fragile you might feel. Crossing landslides require utmost caution. The terrain we were crossing was very unstable and the rocks beneath my feet often shifted unpredictably. The dangers of rocks rolling from the top was always there too. Each step I took had to be measured and deliberated. I kept a close eye on the weather as well as the warm sun, rain or even a strong gust of wind could trigger more landslides, making this situation even riskier. My trekking partners and I moved slowly and communicated constantly to ensure everyone's safe passage through this very difficult landscape. Respecting the land is a fundamental principle of journeys through such fragile ecosystems. We move lightly, being very careful not to disturb the natural balance of this environment. One of the most difficult aspects of this trek was dealing with the melt glacier water. Especially during the mornings as the sun rays melted the glacier, it caused the ice to melt rapidly, resulting in the formation of fast glacial streams. Oftentimes, there are ice axicles which hold the rocks on the high cliffs. And once these ice axicles are melted, the rocks come rolling down. We had to move forward with caution, with our eyes constantly up and down to check for such events happening. Each step we took was a battle against this relentless landscape. It was a moment when fear threatened to overwhelm me, but I focused on my training and my guide and the experience of our guide. We moved slowly and steadily, never underestimating the power of nature. And I slowly felt that the fear was replaced by a sense of accomplishment as we reached closer to Khambachain.
As we ascended, the landscape underwent a transformation. The dense forest gradually gave way to shrubby vegetations, which are hardy bushes that have adapted to the challenging altitude. Yet any weariness we felt from our slow and cautious progress was quickly forgotten in the face of breathtaking vistas that surrounded us. The closer we got to the towering peaks, the more otherworldly experience we received. The snow-covered summits felt like they were reaching into the heavens. Our original plan was to visit the Kumbhakarna base camp. However, the treacherous terrain, marked by multiple landslides, compelled us to rethink our decision. Safety became our top priority, prompting us to stick to the trail leading to Khambache, while the path to Kumbhakarna veered in a different direction. The mountains had shown us their majestic allure and their formidable power in equal measures. Khambachen, nestled in the embrace of the giant Himalayan peaks, is a remote settlement that seemed untouched. The name Khambache is said to be derived from the local Tibetan dialect. Khan means white and Bachen signifies settlements. Hence the name Khambachen, which means the white settlement, which is also a testimony to the white peaks surrounding this settlement. The locals of this settlement are known to be very warm and hospitable and often tell stories. about giant yaks and yeti monsters they have spotted. In the end, the trek from Gunsa to Khambache was a physically difficult one, but we enjoyed the day.
this is the great mountain janu as they call it here or as we call it kumbhakarna the journey for today began in the quiet pre-dawn hours as the first lights painted the eastern sky khamba chain our starting point nestled in the foothills of the great kumbhakarna mountain was slowly awakening the air was crisp and carried a chill that clung to my skin serving as a reminder of the formidable task that lay ahead Today we were making the journey from Khamba chain to Lona a seemingly modest 7 to 8 kilometers on the map but the terrain we had crossed before Khamba chain had already given us a glimpse of what lay ahead Before setting out, I fortified myself with a hearty breakfast of eggs and potatoes. In the high altitudes of the Himalayas, where each step demands a considerable effort, carbohydrates were my allies, providing me the fuel I needed to power through the day. The promise of adventure was palpable in the air as I gazed towards the towering giants that loomed above. the snow cap peaks catching the first rays of the morning sun mornings in the high altitudes had a deceptive charm the sun kissed the landscape with warmth but biting winds that would descend from the heights towards the noon was a constant reminder of the unforgiving nature of these mountains Trekking in these high winds often times puts dust in your eyes and makes it very difficult to breathe. It was a paradox to start. Should I start at sunrise and witness the breathtaking view of the mountains and vistas and endure the bone-chilling cold that accompanied it, or should I start later and trek through the winds, which would again be very discomforting? I chose trekking early as the sun's first rays kissed those colossal peaks. I felt a simultaneous sense of awe. The Himalayas aren't just mountains. They are titans that seem to reach up to the very heavens. With my trusty backpack firmly strapped to my shoulder and a trekking pole in hand, I took the first momentous step onto the trail to Lonak, a path that would lead me into the deeper Himalayas of the Kanchenjunga range. Khamba chain to Lonak was a journey that promised both breathtaking vistas and an immersion into an untouched wilderness of Nepal. This remote region devoid of modern amenities allowed travelers to become one with the pristine himalayan environment it all began in khamba chain a humble village approximately at 4050 meters with the kanchenjunga national park from there we embarked on a trail meandering alongside the crystalline glacial rivers starting from the very kanchenjunga mountain following the challenging mixed rugged terrain as well as unmarked paths As I ascended higher into the mountains the trail grew steeper rockier and more relentless Each step felt like a battle against gravity and the thin air intensified the struggle Breathing became a conscious effort and the relentless altitude began to take a toll. My heart started hammering in my chest and my lungs clamored for oxygen. 
It was a brutal uphill climb, pushing me to the brink of exhaustion. Yet, amid the physical strain, the beauty surrounding me was captivating. The towering peaks pierced into the sky and the snowy crowns glittered in the light. The glacial lakes mirrored the heavens, and the silence was occasionally broken by a distant rumble of avalanches. It was as if we had entered the realm untouched by time. The silence was not absolute though. There was always a constant sound of wind blowing against your ears, reminding you of how unforgiving this entire environment is. As we ventured higher, we came across rare alpine flora, some tenacious edelweiss, an array of mosses and lichens adapted to these harsh conditions. The region was also a sanctuary for diverse wildlife, like the Himalayan thaw, blue sheep and the elusive snow leopard. Bird enthusiasts often come here and find the joy in sporting variant pheasants, eagles, vultures soaring gracefully above the towering peaks. The inhabitants of this remote area are mostly originated from Tibet and their lives are intertwined with Tibetan Buddhism. Along the trail, we can find small prayer wheels or stupas. These stupas bore witness to the spiritual beliefs of the locals and it always reminded me of the warm hospitality to which they welcome trekkers. Along this trail, I encountered absolutely no other trekkers and this is a testimony to the trail's remoteness. The unwavering spirit of my fellow trekkers, each with their own taste of perseverance and determination, became a inspiration for me, pushing us onwards into the heart of Kanchenjunga. As I pushed through the final demanding steps of my journey, my anticipation grew and I knew that what awaited me would be extraordinary. At last, I reached Lonark, a remote wilderness and a breathtaking spectacle unfolded before my eyes. Lonark was the last village in the Himalayas and it felt like the final frontier. The air had turned thinner and dustier. This was partly because the wind blew over the dried lake bed of the Lonark Lake. The lake had dried up not because of global warming, but due to glacial movements and earthquakes, which had cracked open crevices and let the water flow freely downstream into the glacial river starting from the Kanchenjunga mountain. Lonark was pristine and isolated. It was nestled among towering peaks that stretched towards the sky. The surrounding mountains stood as majestic sentinels, their formidable heights embracing this hidden sanctuary. The golden hues of the sun kissed the peaks and the abundant wildlife around was a sight to behold. Far away in one of the slopes, I noticed some movement. It was a herd of blue sheep. The sheep were very well camouflaged. They were initially very far away in the slope, but later they came closer into the village. Blue sheep are scientifically known as Sudosis nayaur and they are a species of wild sheep 
native to the mountainous regions of Central Asia and particularly to the Himalayas. They are often commonly referred to as Bharal or Narur in different regions. You might be wondering, these blue sheep are not blue, hence why are they called blue? But the name blue sheep comes from their bluish grey coats which provide them with the camouflage against the rocky backdrop of this mountain habitat. Blue sheep are herbivorous and primarily graze on a variety of alpine grasses and herbs. Their diet is well adapted to the high altitude environments they inhabit, but they often come into villages as villagers feed them with salt. They need this mineral to thrive in the high altitude. The natural predators of blue sheep include snow leopards, wolves and occasional bears. The cryptic color helps them blend into the surrounding and avoid detection. I was wondering if I would be lucky enough to spot a snow leopard. There was prey here and hopefully the hunter would arrive soon. I went to sleep that night with a feeling of satisfaction. Although I could not sleep that well due to the high altitude and the frigid cold, I was well rested to start our trek to Pang Pema, which was the final frontier to the Kanchenjunga base camp. The next morning, I was overwhelmed by the picturesque vistas. I had no choice but to lie down and surrender to the beauty. I felt the earth beneath me and gazed into the clouds, drifting lazily across the colossal peaks. The gentle breeze carried the smell of the earth while the birds sang their melodious songs, creating a sensory symphony that filled me with an indescribable sense of peace. No crowds, no traffics, no distractions, just pure, unspoiled nature. It felt as if time had frozen this place and this untamed wilderness. Far away in the distance, I spotted a sculpture that initially looked like a man-made statue. It somewhat resembled a stone head gazing into the valley, looking at the glacier change every second. Later I realized that it was just a sculpture that was created by the wind. It was another marvel of nature, reminding me of the profound beauty that exists in our world and is often overshadowed by the hustle and bustle of daily life and hence we often overlook the beauty around us. It's often important to take time off from our daily life and come into these wild places just to feel alive again. I would like to read out an expert from the book Becoming a Mountain by Stephen Alter. He says, Healing is a journey like any other, a slow, solitary quest leading towards a distant, unattainable summit. Afterwards, when you tell your story, the act of narration dictates coherence and chronology. But while traveling, while flesh and mind repair themselves, there is no clear itinerary. Weeks and months of wandering are punctuated by abrupt arrivals and prolonged departures. Your body is a map with roots sketched on its veins and arteries. With mountains and valleys of muscle and bone, walking these trails you grow stronger. Your pain diminishes, returns and then eases once again. Yet even before you arrive at the expected point of culmination, when you are finally well again, or when you find yourself at the top of the mountain, the story is just the beginning.
As we inched closer, the elusive base camp was now within my sight, and I couldn't shake the constant thoughts of the expert whose wisdom had guided me through this. In the labyrinth of my mind, nothing unfolded as I had meticulously planned. The ever-shifting timings and unexpected rest days had become the norm, leaving me feeling adrift. But as I drew nearer to the base camp, my perceptions dissolved into the thin mountain air. We found ourselves navigating a treacherous mountain slope scarred by relentless force of landslides. Yet we made it across. Even here, nature's theatre unfolded before us, as the glacier, in its unhurried geological dance, devoured the neighbouring mountains, mountainside, meticulously erasing its slopes. This spectacle was nothing short of breathtaking, drawing us closer with each cautious step towards the Kanchenjunga base camp. As we pressed forward with unwavering determination, the enigmatic allure of the ultimate destination, the Kanchenjunga South base camp beaconed us. The base camp, which I had always envisioned as a bustling hub of activity, was a stark contrast to my imaginations. It was just the three of us here, isolated amidst the serene and silence of the Himalayas. The stillness was haunting, broken only by the occasional rustle of the wind and the distant echoes of breaking glaciers. It was nothing like the Everest base camp which was full of people and tents and activity. The glacier in front of us claimed the mountain slopes, eroding its contour into a geological ballet of ice. It was a mesmerizing sight, a slow-moving spectacle of nature's power and patience. The anticipation that had plagued my thoughts for so long seemed to dissipate. I had felt a newfound sense of peace, as if the very act of being here was a form of healing. My expectations of finding a bustling community of climbers and colourful tents had been replaced by the solitude of this place. A tiny weather-beaten hut stood as a solitary sentinel, a testament to the intrepid souls who had ventured there before us. Nearby, a somber monument paid tribute to those who had lost their lives in their relentless pursuit to summit, a stark reminder of the mountain's unforgiving nature. But it was the colossal presence of the Mount Kanchenjunga that stole this show. Snow on its mighty slopes sparkled like diamonds, casting a radiant glow across the landscape. It was a sight that left us all awestruck. A vision that seemed so distant for so long was right in front of me. I had always found myself drawn closer to the mountain. All my life I had admired this mountain from a distance. I was always irresistibly compelled to get close and personal with this mountain which was my lifelong admiration. Now that this had happened, with reverence I joined my hands and bowed before the towering presence of the Holy Mother Kanchenjunga, humbled by Her Majesty and the journey that had brought me here. In that solitary moment of reverence, I felt a profound connection to the mountain and the stories it held, realizing that this day, this chapter of my life had finally arrived. I felt a profound sense of accomplishment. The journey to this remote corner of the world had been an inspiration for me, and the sight before me had made every step worth it. With a heavy heart, I knew that it was time to go back to Gunza. We were excited about the second leg of our journey, 
to the south base camp and see the south face of Kanchenjunga. I passed by yak herders and saw their herds lazily grazing through the lush grass. We exchanged warm smiles with the locals I had come across as I bid adieu to them and this pristine wilderness. The trail downwards meandered through the woods. It looked like a world away from the icy desolate heights that I had left behind. It was amazing how a few hundred meters of altitude can change the environment so drastically. Going up, I had a goal in mind, but walking down and looking into the valley made me admire the beauty even more. With every step, I felt the weight of the past day's adventures go away from my shoulders. I still felt exhausted and tired though, but the physical and mental challenges I had faced seemed like a distant memory now, replaced by a sense of tranquility and contentment. It was as if the mountains themselves were whispering stories into my soul. I felt like I had been to Mayel and come back from Mayel. The Lepcha people, who are indigenous to the areas around the Kanchenjunga mountain, have rich oral traditions and they tell stories which have been passed on through the generation. And Mayel is a central character in the myths and stories. Mayel is often depicted as a celestial being or a deity associated with the nature and forests and mountains. The Lepcha people revere Mayel as a protector and a guardian of a natural world. Mayel, the deity, lives in a mystical valley near the Kanchenjunga mountain. This valley is called Mayel Lang. Lepchas believe in a terrestrial paradise similar to the Tibetan idea of Beyul. In Tibetan, this valley is known as Beyul Demshong. The idea of Beyul is closely tied with spiritual and physical geography of the Himalayas especially in the regions like Bhutan and parts of Nepal and Tibet. The Lepchas call the promised land Mayel Lang. Ma means hidden and Yel means eternal and Lang means land. This is where the mother goddess Nuzong Nai stays somewhere in the upper region surrounding the Kanchenjunga. The migratory birds passing through Sikkim are said to be flying to Mayel Lang where they build nests and lay their eggs. There is an interesting tale about Mayel. This story tells us about a fisherman who was traveling upriver into the mountains. He suddenly finds himself in this idyllic valley. Here, he meets an elderly couple who welcomed him into their home and offered him food and shelter. The fisherman was fed and happily slept outside without knowing the surprise he was about to get. The next morning, when he wakes up, the fisherman discovers two children playing outside. The elderly couple was nowhere to be found. When he asked the children, they started laughing and told him that they were the same elderly couple from the previous day. All the inhabitants of this valley pass through a lifetime every day. From infancy at daybreak and childhood until noon, they will continue aging until midnight. With each new day, the cycle begins again and this way they never die. These stories are told and retold for generations. The tale of the value of immortality is well known to both the original inhabitants of this area, the Lepcha people, and those of the Tibetan Buddhist cultural tradition as well. In Tibet, 
This valley is known as Beyul Demoshong. The idea of Beyul is closely tied to spirituality and physical geography. These hidden lands are considered to be sanctuaries where practitioners can engage in meditation, contemplation, and spiritual practices to attain higher states of realization. Beyuls are believed to have specific qualities including being places of profound natural beauty, abundance of resources, and the sense of being protected from the worldly distractions and negativeness. The experience of being in Beul is to facilitate spiritual growth, deepening one's practice and bring one individual closer to enlightenment. Pilgrimages to Beul are a common practice among Tibetan Buddhists seeking a deeper connection to their faith and more profound understanding of the spiritual journey. After reaching Gunsa, I had a nice two days of rest, and I also met my dear doggo friend Gajo. I think he was happy to see me. The next day, we started our journey very early to cross the Setele Pass. It was going to be a very long day. In 1962, a Tibetan monk named Tulchuk Lingpa led 12 followers up the Kanchenjunga to find this unseen land of perpetual bliss. Tulchuk is said to have been holding a bundle of scriptures and chanting certain sacred syllables aloud while he made his way up. Suddenly, the world vanished, engulfed in a white mass of snow. It was an avalanche and Tulchuk disappeared under it. Did he find the valley? This is the question that locals have been asking among themselves for ages. People often describe the mountains through adjectives like fearsome, ghastly, treacherous, demonic, and they often suggest a positive power and goodness of the majestic magnificence of the mountains, but sometimes it creates a negative connotation. Today's hike to the Selile Pass was unlike any trek we had experienced before. Our usual trek had taken us through the familiar valleys, but this time our path led us to the towering heights of the mountain tops. The steep incline already made progress slow, testing our endurance and perseverance, reminding us that this was going to be a very long day. As we ascended to the pinnacle of the pass, the breathtaking panorama unfurled before us. The valley below seemed distant and every house appeared like tiny ants in the vast landscape. The peaks were so close that they felt like they were within arm's reach. Yet we knew the unpredictable nature of mountain passes. The weather, though favorable today, had a notorious reputation for its sudden changes. Turning from bright sun, to fierce winds and blinding snows in mere moments. The shift from the serene and welcoming mountain valleys to the rigorous nature of mountain pass was palpable. It was a reminder that the mountain held its own rules and could swiftly turn treacherous. The contrast from the mountain tops to the valleys were stark, and what lay ahead was unknown. 
we reached the Sailor Le Pass at 10 a.m., anticipating a swift journey to the next hamlet. Little did we know that three passes awaited us: the Sailor Le Pass, the Miring La Pass, and the Sinopche La Pass. The village of Sailor Le greeted us with empty hearths and silent ambience. After having a hearty brunch, we press forward. Looking at the sky, we observe some clouds move towards the mighty peaks. We encountered first snow in our trek as we crossed over the mountains towards the second pass. The snow was deep but there were footprints to guide us boosting our confidence It was just 30 minutes that we had started trekking that a sudden blizzard hit us. We were buried neck deep in snow as we took shelter under a rock. What began as a short trek through the snow had turned treacherous within a sudden second. We tried to boil some snow and drink some warm water. keep us hydrated we realized that the blizzard had wiped out all the footmarks that were guiding us we were scared cold and lost we tried to keep our feet warm to avoid frostbite the thought of survival drove us off the threat of frostbite while seeking ways of getting help but help was nowhere to come from in this remote desolate land the only way we could get help is if we helped ourselves Once the blizzard subsided, my guide and friend Oshan powered through the soft snow, carving a path for us. I was not ready to give up, and I was not ready to see the mystical land of my El yet. I wanted to go home. I wanted to go back to my people. Every step plunged us thigh deep into the snow, but our determination to survive pushed us forward. As darkness descended, I took the lead, unwilling to accept defeat. My friend Oshan was tired and exhausted, but he had this unwavering spirit that kept us going forward. We pressed on conquering the third pass and we finally reached the village of Seram at 10:45 at night. It was a grueling trek of over 18 hours that day. Exhausted but grateful to have emerged unscathed from the ordeal, we sought refuge in the lodge. By the warmth of the fire, we recounted our harrowing journey, soothing our weary legs in warm water. I decided to forego the ascent to the south base camp and everybody else decided to unanimously follow me considering the unfavorable weather. The person at the lodge told us that this was one of the most strongest snowfall he had seen in this area. It was lucky that we made it through. This was another testament to human resilience against unforgiving might of the mountain.
Today's journey was going to take us from Seram to Yamfudin. I immediately noticed that we were on the rainy side of the valley as this area receives significantly more rain as compared to the other side. Flora and fauna around us was a testament to this. Mosses, lichens and a variety of plants and animals adorn this side of the valley unlike the other. The weather from the previous night hadn't receded yet and the sun remained elusive. The air was frosty and cold and damp. I felt like I was traversing through a mystical land from the Hobbit with a thick canopy of up and wet grounds beneath teeming with leeches and mosses. I also encountered the occasional leech attempting to cling to my boots but failing to reach my skin and draw my blood. In this part of the trail, without proper gear, leeches could be extremely annoying. The trail wound through the subtropical part of the Himalayas, adorned with vibrant and fragrant magnolias and delicate orchids. The captivating sounds of birds also added to the trail's enjoyment. This trek offered a remarkable immersion into the diverse plant life, mosses and captivating scenery of the Kanchenjunga region, leaving inedible memories of its unique beauty. All of us were still a little shell-shocked from what had happened at the Selele Pass. My friend Oshan was particularly saddened that we didn't make it to the South Base Camp. However, while making the decision to skip the South Base Camp, I considered that the weather might worsen during our ascent, obstructing the view. Also, I made a promise to myself that I would return back to the heart of Kanchenjunga and to the South Base Camp. This would be one of the reasons that would bring me back to this part of the world. The trek from Sheram to Yamfudin goes through the village of Trorongten. And this part of the trek was specially different as we walked through lush rainforest. Yet, I was eager to return home and enjoy some warm tea and spicy food and have a nice hot shower. I longed to re-enter civilization. It was so easy to forget all the comfort and amenities we took for granted in civilization. Electricity, warm water and hot food and tiny conveniences. But being in nature, I realized the meticulous nature of humans and how difficult it is to bring these things to our doorsteps. There was no Amazon delivery here and there was no food delivery or Uber Eats here. Initially, we planned to celebrate the completion of the trek at Elam village, but we forewent this idea and decided to head to our respective homes. Oshan did present us with two khadas in our honor. Khadas are Nepali ceremonial scarves and they are an integral part of Nepali and Tibetan culture and they are used in various religious, cultural and social occasions. It is common for hosts to present khadas to the guests as a gesture of honor and warm welcome. I was delighted to receive this token from him. This journey through the mountains had taught me a lot and changed me internally. It was a journey that not only tested my physical endurance, but also cultivated essential virtues like humility and delicacy, leaving an inedible mark in my soul. The essence of this extraordinary journey lies not just in conquering the mountain passes or reaching summits, 
but in the profound connection one forms with nature the essence lies in the awe inspiring landscapes that humble the human spirit and remind us of the places in the intricate tapestry of life it lies in the delicate dance between determination and respect as we move forward with purpose while respecting the natural world that surrounds us furthermore the essence lies in a soul stirring encounters with locals who have called the himalayas home their resilience simplicity and genuine warmth touches our hearts prompting us to reflect the true meaning of life and happiness in their humble adobes and hospitable gestures we found a profound lesson in humility reminding us that true wealth is often found in simplicity of life and the richness of human connections trekking in the himalayas transforms the soul leaving an inedible mark of humility and the delicacy it serves as a gentle reminder that in the grand tapestry of existence our roles are humble our actions should be delicate and the essence of fulfilling life lies in the harmonious coexistence with nature and our fellow beings